and welcome back to another segment of the Grassy you Knoll. We're still standing this 11th of October, 2006. We have with us today, I can say, it's, it's a little cliche, but nevertheless true. You know, they need no introduction. It's the Collins brothers, Philip and Paul. You first heard them on this show with uh, regard to um, their jointly uh, written book called The Ascendancy of the uh, Scientific Dictatorship. Since then, they both have a number of titles uh, to their credit. And what, we, what we're going to do today is uh, talk about a recent article called... Uh, in bed with the enemy. You can find that on conspiracyarchive.com. Go to commentary and you'll see it right there. That is in bed with the enemy. Uh, so if you want to uh, read along with us or if you want to just consult it as we go along now or later, there it is. And uh, thanks, guys, for coming back to the show. Thanks, Liz. All righty. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Um, this is a very strange chapter with regard especially to, I think, uh, Republican doings. And, of course, we're not, and uh, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, but... Uh, They've done some interesting things with the uh, Islam and uh, Arab communities, and I think you're going to share that with us today. So uh, why don't you take off with it? Okay. Well, I start off by pointing out in my article that Huey Long once asserted that fascism would show up in the United States as anti-fascism. Now, <clears throat> different people feel different ways about Huey Long. Some people think he was a demagogue. Other people think that he was a populist hero. I'm personally... I believe that there's some that the truth lies somewhere in the middle with that guy. But whatever you feel about him, uh, the, his assertion there is actually quite sound and probably hits the nail on the head. Um, it, we, we had the president uh, holding this conference, this press conference, at his Texas ranch, if you can call it a ranch. But oh, you mean that, that, that Hollywood set up there? Or? Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> You know, at that, at that Monica up there in Texas, where he basically said that what we're dealing with, that the terrorists are, uh, are Islamic fascists. Now, in my article, I, I point out that I believe that the president's contention about these Arab terrorists is by and large correct. And that if you listen to some of the things that they say, there's very little difference between them and a goose-stepping, die-in-the-wool, ideological Nazi. Um, if you look at some of these different groups, if you look at, uh, at uh, uh, for instance, the PLO, if you look at uh, their leader who passed away not too long ago, Yasser Arafat, you know, who was probably one of the worst terrorists ever. Uh, most people don't remember that, remember his, uh, his different escapades and the different horrible things he was involved in. Uh, he was taught by Otto Skorzeny. You know, the, the Nazi, and a lot of Nazi tactics, uh, guerrilla tactics, are used by these guys, and, and a lot of the same uh, beliefs that are shared in common with, with, with the Nazis. And so, I mean, th so there is, does seem to be some truth in what the president was saying. <coughs> but the problem is, is that when you look at, at the... Uh, at the, the state of American government nowadays, and if you look at what's going on in the government, you start to determine that there is a huge amount of hypocrisy in Bush's statement, because two things are going on simultaneously here. Uh, the government, on one hand, is denouncing Islamofascism, and then, on the other hand, we see criminal factions in the government actually connected to these terrorists. So Islamofascism, in my article, I, I contend, is not just uh, the, the refuge for fanatics, but instead it is a government-sponsored, state-sponsored enterprise you know, involving uh, individuals in our government which... L. Fletcher Prouty would have referred to as a secret team, um, <coughs> a shadow government that has basically latched on to the legitimate uh, constitutional government. Uh, and these guys are basically what's keeping these Islamofascists going. And uh, the individual that I basically saw as connecting the government to the terrorist network was an individual named Grover Norquist. Now, Norquist is a GOP Bush operative. <clears throat> Many people probably know that he was involved in getting the president's uh, 
support and approval rating up amongst Islamic people here in the United States. And uh, Nation Magazine has referred to him as the field marshal of the Bush plan. Uh, but but Norquist is basically tied to these to these uh, to these different Islamo fascist groups, namely through his lobbying firm Janus Merritt Strategies, uh, <laughs> which is a lobbyist for the Islamic Institute uh, and for the uh, and for uh, the American Muslim Council. Now the head of the American Muslim Council is Abdurrahman Alamudi, and Alamudi was at, at an anti-Israel protest outside of the White House, and that was back in 2000, and it, it was some, pretty much around this time of year. Uh, and he basically came out saying that he was a supporter of Hamas and Hezbollah at this meeting, <laughs> and um, of course both of those groups, you know, the State Department has listed as, as terrorist organizations. Uh, another individual that spoke for, that's spoken at the American Muslim Council meetings is an individual named Sami al Arian. Mm -hmm. And he is uh, a Kuwaiti born Palestinian. Uh, he's a professor at a university uh, in Florida. <laughs> and he was at uh, one of the uh, meetings of the American Muslim Council, and at this meeting he called out all the different stuff that we would recognize as the jihadist message. He called for the death of Israel. He called for the, the you know, for uh, Islam moving into uh, Jerusalem and <laughs> all of that good, great stuff. And um, the thing is, is that in 2000, uh, El Arian got to meet George and Laura Bush at a mosque in Tampa uh, with a, groups of, a group of other uh, Muslim leaders. And this whole thing was, of course, brokered by Norquist. Now, Norquist and, uh, has even deeper ties <coughs> into Islam than that. Um, for instance, we know that he's married uh, a Muslim woman and clearly he would not be able to do that unless he himself had converted to uh, Islam because Muslim women are only allowed to marry Muslim men. Strict tradition. <laughs> the, the woman he married is a woman named Sama al Reyes, and she's a Palestinian Muslim. Her name is now, of course, Sama Norquist. But the interesting thing I noticed about her was that she uh, is an employee of the U.S. Agency for International Development. And that, of course, brings us back to something that we've spoken about before, because <laughs> the Agency for International Development was, does, was involved in a radicalization project amongst Muslim people. Uh, they used the Afghan, uh, the, uh, the uh, invasion by the Soviets as a pretext for bringing in violent uh, textbooks to Afghan children mm -hmm. to essentially radicalize them with a violent form of Islam. And uh, <coughs> those books were made at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and um, it was made with a grant from the Agency for International Development, and the agency spent uh, $51 million <coughs> from about 84. 84 to 94 on this project. So, what I suggest is that Norquist and his wife are a uh, husband-wife uh, group <coughs> involved in radical in the, involved in the business of radicalization. And uh, Norquist uh, turning to Islam would actually help him to solidify ties between the uh, Islamofascist and the government. <laughs> so, now, now people might wonder, um, well, what is this man? Is he, is he working for them? Is he working for the government? Who is he working for? And the question is, is that, is both. 
the, the answer to that question is both, because what you got to understand is a lot of these operatives that are involved in erecting what we would call the New World Order are basically double and triple agents. <laughs> they understand that no matter what side wins, that the ends are the same, <laughs> and they want to be involved in both. Now, I mean, they want to be—they want to be just involved, so that whoever comes out on top, uh, they end up sharing some kind of stake in that future. Um, a good example, another good example that illustrates my point, is uh, is Henry Kissinger. Uh, Kissinger is, of course, was involved with and made an honorary member of the Royal Institute of International Affairs which has caused some some individuals, <laughs> namely those within the LaRouche trajectory, to say that he was a, he's a British agent here in the United States. But if you look back at his army days, he was also, <laughs> there's a considerable amount of evidence that he was a Soviet mole. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, Paul? Yeah. What well, I'm going to suggest, Philip, you there? Yeah. Uh, Paul, you want to grab yourself some water? Yeah, let me, let me just yeah. grab a drink real fast. Okay, yeah, I mean, because uh, that sounds painful for you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, and in the meantime, Philip, i tell you what. Why don't we talk about um, uh, where your readings, um, your writings, rather, can be read across a number of websites. Uh, you want to pick that up for us yeah, now? Yeah, and tell them about the e sure, too. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, well, uh, due to popular demand, <laughs> much like a commercial, but due to popular demand, um, we are now converting... The uh, Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship, the Expanded Revised Edition, we are now converting it to ebook format, and it will be uh, available via uh, uh, a closer look, uh, www.4theNumber4aclosserlook.com, and that's, of course, the official website of A Closer Look, which broadcasts out of uh, Denver, Colorado, and is hosted by Michael Corbin. This, this version will be uh, uh, pretty much the electronic version. It might even feature some additional graphics and uh, a little bit of new information. Um, also, uh, we all of our uh, our writings, uh, the most comprehensive collection of them, have been uh, pretty much compiled by our good friend uh, Terry Melanson, who uh, hosts uh, Conspiracy Archive. Mm -hmm. And they can be found at www.conspiracyarchive, all one word, conspiracyarchive dot com forward slash commentary with a capital C forward slash Collins with a capital C dot PHP. But uh, uh, if if you have trouble uh, remembering all that, just go to uh, www.conspiracyarchive.com, uh, click the commentary link, and the uh, list of commentators will appear. And uh, Paul and I are amongst the uh, uh, commentators there. And all you have to do is click that link, and you're instantly taken there. Uh, there you'll find uh, not only articles, but you'll also find uh, some archived audio from uh, other interviews that we've done. And uh, it's the, one of the most uh, comprehensive uh, collections of our writings on the Internet. And uh, Terry has done just a fabulous job with it. So, yeah, that's where that's where a, a majority of our work can be found. Are, are you thinking about uh, uh, collating any or all of the um, the articles and uh, putting that in hard copy or ebook? Uh, well, I, I, that's a very good question. Um, there, as I understand, there was somebody who was compiling all of our articles uh, and uh, basically distributing it, it as an ebook. Uh, they <laughs> they were pretty much doing that as their own endeavor. But um, well, I, w I was considering uh, putting together all of our essays into one comprehensive tome and everything. If if we can uh, if we can get around to doing that, we have so yeah. many other projects on the burner right now. So. Of course, that, that you know, that's one that's one project you know that's that's uh, pretty much you know <laughs> on, you the, on the drawing board, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say it's interesting today um, that we're talking about Grover Norquist because something that struck me way back when was his duality. I think that that's what we're talking about today, which is kind of confusing and doesn't really make sense to me either. Whereas they could be occurring uh, favor <clears throat> with the Arab community, with the Islamic community and at the same time uh, declaring them more or less, and this is before 9-11, uh, but also declaring them uh, you know, a problem and a radical and a threat to a Christianity. And this whole situation with Sammy Al-Aryan I find very, very curious, because that happened in our own backyard here. And, um, you know, he, 
you, you talk about the right to a speedy trial, and this guy, actually we believe he got sent to a, a, a prison that had like probably three people in it, about 50 miles north of where we are, a brand new facility. And we always wondered, like, what was going on? And when does this guy finally get his day in court? Now, I'm not pro or against him, um, but I do believe that the United States was never, ever um, a target for his rhetoric. It was rather Israel that was. And there's some curiousness about whether or not uh, Genshaft, who was president in and around that time, had anything to do uh, with uh, facilitating, shall we say, uh, his departure from the, uh, uh, the faculty. Now, of course, universities do have a policy that if you do anything that brings the university into, shall we say, um, an ill light, if you will, uh, that that could be uh, grounds for dismissal. And on that, it may be legitimate. But like I said, we've had this duality, uh, not only with um, Norquist and the Republican Party and uh, Islam, but also uh, with uh, Al Arian and Bush. So um, that's as far as I can bring it here. That's all I really wanted to add. And uh, uh, yeah, if you no. guys want to pick it up, go ahead. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, I'm back. Well, you know, on that duality, again, a lot of these guys that are involved, <clears throat> the covert oper operatives and these different uh, individuals that are involved in creating the New World Order, um, they play almost every single side. We're talking about double and triple agents. Mm -hmm. You know, the different factions of the elite, they know one or the one of them are going to top out become the top dog in the end um, and become the dominant interest in the, uh, in, the in, in this new world order <laughs> so they want to have some kind of stake in that future and so uh, I mean and uh, again uh, Henry Kissinger is a big example of this there's evidence that he worked for the Soviets there's also evidence that he worked for the British elite and so what you got is you have a guy that is basically uh, that knows that that the, the end is going to be one or one of these groups of the elites actually uh, ascending. And, and we see the same thing with Grover Norquist. Well, is he working for the Islamofascists or is he working for the government for the United States government? And the the answer is really, really, uh, it's, it's, it's both. Yeah. And you have to understand how the game is played. And that, you know, and what, what, every, what they understand <coughs> in, in the deep politics that are involved here. Well, let me ask you a question, Paul, okay? Okay. Um, because uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I won't derail your thought, but now, even with, with the whole idea of the Arab community and, um, and whether it's Islam or whatever, not that all Arabs are necessarily Muslim, but do you find there's also a little special treatment among all the Middle Eastern states' people, uh, something that's a little bit different when you're dealing with Saudis? Oh, yes, exactly. Uh, um, well, let me tell you, so, tell you a little story um, <laughs> on, that, on that note. Um, I know guys that work in intelligence. And, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when we do talk, you know, we, uh, we, we talk a lot. Now, I have never, I have never received what I, could, what I could call a smoking gun from these guys. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I would liken uh, sitting and, and speaking to them to sitting in a coffee shop having a discussion with, uh, with uh, Alan Greenspan, actually. And all you, you end up, I mean, you're 15 minutes into the conversation, it's driving nuts, and you want to stick sodium pentothal into his mocha just to get a straight answer. <laughs> That's what it's a lot like. But I'll tell you, if you know, if you, if you know how, what to ask, and you know how to ask it, it's funny what, what falls out. And I was talking to this guy that works in, in intelligence, and <laughs> he works over here, uh, here in this state, here at uh, Wright Patterson. And I and I said to him, I said, look, uh, I know that you can't s tell me, you know, straight on uh, uh, forward on on certain issues, certain things. You know, so I just want to throw this at you as a little hypothesis that I have and that other people have. And I said, um, you know, we have this <coughs> problem with an insurgency in Iraq, and um, 
uh, I, I, I said, I said, I, I, you know, it looks to it, it looks to me that that uh, these guys there in Iraq might be actually being funded by or or supported in some way by big oil and and by their Saudi allies. Because what it does is it basically keeps the oil infrastructure down and it keeps the Iraqi oil off the market, keeps the prices nice and high, and it also actually gives kind of a boost to the peak oil crowd. And, all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and it does, because for uh, two or three years there, I believed peak oil. And, and the, the, the uh, signs and indicators to me seemed to be there in the prices and in the supposed scarcity and all when you know and I didn't really consider the fact that that uh, you know some of this oil could have been being kept off the markets uh, through the war on terror and all and so I said you know maybe these oil companies and maybe the Saudis their Saudi allies are somehow supporting these guys over in Iraq to keep that oil from <coughs> from getting on the Iraqi market and uh, this guy said to me, he said, uh, I can't tell you you're right. I can't tell you that you're wrong. What I will tell you is that that is a very interesting hypothesis, and I would continue working with that and everything. And that was his way of telling me, yeah. you know. And, and so that goes back to what you're saying with the Saudis. The Saudis, there seems to be this hands-off thing with them, and yet they seem to be the the biggest exporters of terrorism uh, next to Pakistan. Yeah. Pakistan seems to have this kind of hands-off yeah, that's true. kind of mentality at work there as as well. well you know. What's also interesting is, uh, uh, Paul, w- with regard to uh, Saudi Arabia, they supposedly have one of the most militant groups there, which is the Wahhabis, right? Right. But, on the other hand, and we've also heard about how... Uh, 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 Fassel's uh, house is going to crash, and they're going to get overtaken, and, and um, uh, what was it, Qatar is going to come on as, like, the, the big poobah down there. All this stuff comes and goes about the Saudis, but it's like nothing ever happens, and they seem to be, like, the consummate businessmen among the Middle Eastern states. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I believe that there's a little bit of truth to that whole threat, although I believe that they just uh, periodically bring that up to get support from the West. Okay. And everything. Okay. Now, I, I do believe that while they support these terrorists, that the Frankenstein monster can turn on the mm-hmm. doctor, so to speak, because they don't want any of these groups back in Saudi Arabia. They're like, please don't send them here. They'll tear us down. Well, is it, and is it Mecca in Saudi Arabia? Uh, I believe I believe so. Don't quote me on this gospel truth on that, but I believe you're right. Yeah, because I also think that that's, that's a situation, too, where if anything happens there, that could really ignite the whole Middle East. And, of course, a lot of people um, have their uh, glasses on, so to speak, to keep an eye on this in the event there would be, say, uh, a desecration in Mecca blamed on the West. You can see where that's going, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So, go okay. ahead. I know. Well, um, in my article, what I end up doing is looking for evidence that Norquist might be the shepherd mm-hmm. for the government, for government-sponsored terrorists. And the evidence that I found lies with this group called GreenQuest. <laughs> Operation GreenQuest was basically a Treasury Department task force. And this group uh, was like gangbusters. They were absolutely magnificent. They were, they were going after individuals and uh, organizations that seemed to be fronts for Islamic terrorism. And Grover Norquist basically led the charge against GreenQuest and uh, basically called the raids uh, civil rights violations. And, used, and kind of condemned the whole thing on uh, the grounds of civil rights. Now, what I say in my article, and I contend, is that Norquist is probably not so much concerned about civil rights as he's concerned about, about what an investigation of these different groups will bring out. And it will bring out, basically, connections to the government and to several different elites. If you look at one of the targets that Wood and Green Quest went after, they went after Jamal Barzinji. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> he was listed as a representative of the World Assembly of Muslim Youth. 
But this brings us right back to the Saudis that you were just mm-hmm. talking about. Because, I mean, because they are an arm of the Saudi regime. And they're, they're located in, uh, in Virginia. Um, but uh, uh, back uh, in, uh, prior to September 11th, the Bush administration had effectively blocked an FBI investigation into the World Assembly of Muslim Youth. They killed it. And uh, the, the, the thing is, is that uh, Abdullah bin Laden, who is uh, Osama's younger brother, is president of the World Assembly of Muslim Youth. And an investigation probably would have brought out that uh, Osama is not a black sheep by any stretch of the imagination, but instead that terrorism is actually the family business, which wouldn't have been good for Bush because Bush is tied to... Uh, Bin Laden through Carlisle and through Arbusto Energy. We know that Jim James Bath, <coughs> who is probably uh, some kind of CIA operative, it's been suggested at least. We know he went to work for Salim Bin Laden, and shortly after he went to work for Salim Bin Laden, he made a ten thousand uh, dollar investment, probably on behalf of Bin Laden, into Arbusto Energy, which was George W.'s startup company. But another thing that's interesting to point out about the World Assembly of Muslim Youth is where it's located, this, because it's in Falls Church, Virginia. <coughs> now, that's a big proximity alert going off right there because that's so close to CIA headquarters. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. Ringley mm-hmm. in Virginia. And if you look into Osama's background, what you find is you find a guy that is essentially a CIA uh, creation. Uh, He went to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan around 79. He headed up a group, the Maktab al-Kadamar, known as the MAK. The MAK had uh, money, had weapons funneled to it uh, by the CIA through uh, Pakistan's uh, state security services, the ISI. And uh, so, so this was basically... Uh, a, a CIA fronted organization uh, now when, uh, uh, when uh, around 89 when the war was winding down there in, Afga- in, the, in Afghanistan Bin Laden was still seen by the agency as being kind of a hero and uh, we, we, we also know that that the CIA was very much aware of the fact that Osama bin Laden and his fellow radicals were not contributing anything significant to the anti-communist cause. That they were contributing in no way whatsoever to the fall of communism or to the fall of the Soviet Union. And while they knew that, that uh, Osama bin Laden was not contributing in any in any way shape or form to that fall they were still exaggerating uh, the soviets capabilities uh, in their annual soviet military power report but let me ask you something if i could uh, about osama bin laden now um is it clear to you that he was actually in the united states maybe under the name of tim osman and being shown certain facilities uh, with regard to, um, I guess, uh, shoulder strap nukes and things like that. Uh, do you have anything on that? Uh, no, I, I've never heard anything about that, actually. Okay, now I just, I didn't know how that might fit into the whole uh, uh, puzzle. And also, one other thing, and, and then I think uh, we should do a little ID here, but um, is there, are there any Bin Ladens left in the United States? And I think, were they not operating out of uh, a concern in Boston? Well, I know that the Bin Laden uh, construction firm was here in the United States for a time. Well, <clears throat> what I do know is that they still they received legal advice from Sullivan and Cromwell. And Sullivan and Cromwell is, of course, probably the most powerful firm on Wall Street. And uh, when, when you get into that, you're getting into ties back into the Central Intelligence Agency again, oh. because uh, Sullivan and Cromwell's two primary lawyers uh, were uh, John Foster and Alan Dulles, mm. the Dulles brothers. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, again. Yeah. Oh, well, um, um, you know, the, 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 we, we of course have Alan Dulles being a DCI for a time until 
uh, Kennedy fired him. And we both we have both of those brothers supervising uh, the writing of the National Security Act of 1947, which led to the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency. <clears throat> and if you look at, into uh, the background of Sullivan and Cromwell, what you find is you find a group that has historically supported enemies of the United States. They, for instance, were behind Fritz Thiessen. They were behind I.G. Farben. Mm -hmm. They were behind uh, General Kurt von Schroeder, who was the, the Gestapo general. General. These were all clients of Sullivan and Cromwell. Another interesting thing to draw out, uh, Joseph Trento, uh, a, 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 a researcher and uh, investigative journalist who has done really great work and who came out with one of the most important books over the Central Intelligence Agency, the, the, the Secret History of the CIA, uh, he did, was able to do an interview with James Jesus Angleton prior to Angleton's death. Uh -huh. And nearing the end of his life, Angleton had been basically uh, uh, looked at as a crackpot, as a, as a madman, and he now felt that it was okay to be quite candid about certain things. And so he said, he's sitting there with uh, Joseph Trito, and he says to him, he's like, Do you, would you like to know how I got my job at counterintelligence with the CIA? And so, of course, Trito says yes. And he says, well, the way I did it is that I promised I would not administer a polygraph or a background check to Alan Dulles or 60 of his friends because they were so afraid that it would come out there that they had dealings with Hitler's pals mm -hmm. and all. So, I mean, like, we, we the Dulles, the uh, Cromwell, <coughs> um, Sullivan and Cromwell, we have this, this group that has, has, has historically been in bed with, with the enemy now in bed with the Bin Ladens, and of course it ties us all back, this all back to the uh, Central Intelligence Agency. So we we know that you know there's there are are these ties between the Bin Laden family and these and the supposed hollowed halls of officialdom mm -hmm. and of legitimacy in Wall Street and in uh, and in the government. We also had that strange situation down here, which um, Tampa Airport finally admitted. Uh, the TIA was the uh, site where um, at least one and perhaps two uh, jets uh, from Raytheon uh, flew out uh, members of the Saudi royal family and perhaps those of Bin Laden as well. This happened a few days after 9-11. Uh, I won't say in violation, but let's say they were uh, spared the, the uh, no-flight moratorium that took place then. Do you remember that story at all? Yes, I remember that story. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, too, that the woman who broke the story is a reporter for the St. Petersburg Times. She's also the reporter who uh, called out Daddy Bush's um, lying about the um, Iraqi army massing on the Kuwaiti border. Uh -huh. when she got a look at what was taking place through uh, a Soviet bird overhead. Uh -huh. And uh, so she, you know, she broke two stories twice that were not flattering of the Republicans, and she's still living to this day and writing for the St. Pete Times. Go figure. Uh, we're talking with Philip and Paul Collins. Uh, uh, they've been with us many times before, and at this time, I want to remind you also that you listen to the Grassy Knoll. And would you guys tell us once again where people can go uh, to uh, hit the information and the tiles that you have out there? Go ahead, Phil. Sure, sure. Well, um, we currently have out an expanded, revised edition of the Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship. That's available uh, through Book Search, the uh, book publishing company Book Search. You, know, you can get it at www.booksearch, B O O K S. U-R-G-E dot com. And uh, you, you can also uh, find all of our uh, writings and uh, some archived audio of our interviews at www.conspiracyarchive, all one word, conspiracyarchive dot com forward slash commentary with a capital C forward slash Collins with a capital C dot PHP. And we're also now a regular columnist for the ACL report, which is the official uh, publication of the nationally syndicated radio talk show, a Closer Look, hosted by Michael Corbin. And you can get that magazine at www4, the number 4, a closer look. Dot com. And also coming soon, 
the uh, e-book version of the expanded revised edition of the Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship will also be available there as well. So that gives uh, people something to look forward to and uh, uh, it gives them uh, uh, an electronic uh, version of the book, which might actually even feature uh, additional graphics and what have you. Um, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Sure. Uh, since we plug Corbin so much in this show, tell Corbin you got to plug me once in a while. Sure, sure. <laughs> No problem. We are not jealous here at the Null. This is the great, the, the greatest garage show in uh, America. Uh, also, folks, if you want to ask a question, uh, make a comment uh, to the Collins Brothers, you can do so. If you want to send an email, do such to Visigoth at Hotmail.com. And if you want to send an IM, if you're using Yahoo, it's Viz1400. And if you're using MSN, it's Visigoth. And now back to our regular, regularly re uh, scheduled show. That was easy for me to say. <laughs> Is Paul back to life again? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still hanging in there. Okay, buddy. He's going to get about 24 minutes left. Okay. Well, um, we, we know that, uh, that Robert Gates, the WD director at the Central Intelligence Agency in front of Congress in 92, <coughs> told, us, uh, told, told us all that evidence was being kept from President Reagan about the Soviet's military capabilities and that they were being exaggerated mm -hmm. in the Soviet military uh, power annual report that was given to the president straight up into 90, uh, 1990, and, and, and so as to ju continue to justify sending all this aid to Osama bin Laden and to his radical friends. So why are you sending you know, them support if mm -hmm. you know that they're making no significant contribution to the fight against communism? Yeah, at this point, uh, bin Laden had pretty much outlived his usefulness, at least in terms of the, the anti-Soviet uh, crusade. I mean, he really wasn't serving much of a function there, but for some reason they were still propping him up, which seems to suggest that they had other uh, designs and other, uh, uh, other plans in mind for bin Laden. It becomes obvious that, that the agency obviously wanted to keep him around in spite of his irrelevance in the Cold War crusade because <clears throat> they needed some kind of enemy at a future date. And what you have to understand about the power elite is that by and large they are not a, an improvisational crew. They don't do anything off the cuff. They run off of 10 and 20 and 30 year plans. Um, <clears throat> a good example of what I'm talking about um, there's a book out now called Presidential Doodles, and it's not a conspiratorial book, but it's basically what the title implies. It's a book that, that, that looks into different drawings and scribblings and doodlings that presidents would do uh, in, in the course of a work day. And so I thought, you know, it would be interesting to look at it and to, uh, you know, get, get some... Uh, some, uh, you know, little historical footnotes from it, because that's all I thought that it was worth. I thought, well, gee, you know, when you look at the scribblings and doodlings of a president, you know, you could make up one book about Reagan all by itself, you know. But uh, it was actually one very interesting doodle in it, and it goes back to John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. right. in, in, in this in this doodle, he had a piece of paper, and in the center of the piece of paper were the numbers 911, and then it was circled. And then down at the bottom uh, 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 corner of the paper was written the word conspiracy and all. So, I mean, like, now we can't draw anything proof positive from that. We can't conclusively say anything about that. For all we know, it means that he was going to meet with Marilyn at 11 after 9 o'clock, and the conspiracy was that he had to keep Jackie out of the loop so that he ended up not sleeping on the couch and everything. But, but there's also this possibility that the whole idea was, was floating around Washington even that far, uh, that long ago. Yeah, we know that at you know at uh, at the time in the same you know uh, uh, in the same uh, vicinity historically that already uh, uh, plans uh, involving uh, state terror were already being uh, you know floated about. For instance, Operation Northwood, right. which involved uh, of course the uh, 
<laughs> the uh, uh, carrying out of terrorist acts in order to uh, create a pretext for uh, a war with uh, with Cuba and with Castro. But do you want to get more specific about what two of those scenarios were? Well, one of them was actually t going against uh, America's uh, 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 space race against the. Uh, I mean, was, was uh, one of them was was uh, uh, against airliners. Mm-hmm. You know, and then another one involved uh, the the uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the launching of the, the ship to the moon and everything. Yeah, would have would have involved an act of, of terrorism against our own uh, you know space industry. Well, that's why when people who want to um, well again yeah I don't know we're not going to get into 9/11 now, but the thing is. If there was um, complicity by our government in 9-11, which I believe there was, if nothing else, uh, turning the other way, the Joint Chiefs offered Kennedy the uh, let's shoot down an airliner and blame it on a Cuban MiG, or, and it gets better, uh, put up a uh, swap out the, uh, the airliner and put up a drone and shoot that down, mm -hmm. which always begs the question, what happened to the people? And that's what they asked this day in 9-11. But the thing is, they were willing to do it then. And so 40 years later, would we be surprised to see that... Um, it was still not um, a viable uh, plan. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But another target of the Greencrest rates was this computer software firm known as P-Tech. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's based in Boston. And this, this uh, company has government contracts with, with the Air Force, with the Energy Department, with the FBI. And uh, one of the firm's main investors was uh, Yassine El Qadi. And El Qadi was designated under the Emergency Economic Powers Act by the Bush administration as a terrorist financier. And when uh, people involved in P-TECH, uh, people working for the company came forward and became whistleblowers and tried to uh, let the FBI know about this guy and let them know about terrorist activity coming out of P-TECH, the Bureau didn't do anything with the information that they were given. And the FAA's computers were done by this company prior to 9-11, <laughs> and it basically has their 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 programs have a tremendous uh, capability of allowing somebody to compromise the system, so to speak. Well, PTAC is still floating around. In 2002, six months after the administration had basically placed it on this list of t possible terrorist uh, fronts, and. One of the places that they ended up landing was at uh, uh, the door of J.P. Morgan Chase. Now, uh, the bank's consultant, Indira Singh, who many people have probably heard numerous times on Michael's show, A Closer Look, mm -hmm. uh, had basically invited them in to give a pre presentation. Well, during their presentation, they had a customized demo uh, that they ran for uh, Morgan Chase. Uh, <clears throat> she started to come to the conclusion that something just wasn't right here. Something smelled funny. So she started to get, in, uh, get to make uh, contact with uh, individuals that she knew, with a respected industry figure. And she found out that Yassine al Qadi was tied to P-TECH. And this, of course, upset her. And she ended up going to the FBI with this information, and they told her that they couldn't do anything with it. And then she also went to her bosses at uh, Morgan Chase, and they introduced her to an individual called the, 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 whose position was the general auditor. But she, he told her that for the real purposes of what he did at Morgan Chase, that he was known as the chief thug. And the riot act that he gave her is that is she could either shut up, enjoy the ride, and, all, and, and, and uh, stay with Morgan Chase, or she was going to be kicked out. And so um, the question that I raised was, why would a group like Morgan Chase be tied to terrorists? And there's, of course, the financial considerations. They probably thought there was a lot of money to be made and a profit from uh, joining up with P-TECH on the, this kind of endeavor. But there's also another possibility that one has to consider, too. There's a, there's a deeper motivation here at work. Uh, before it was Morgan Chase, there were, the, the, uh, this firm was actually two institutions. And one of those institutions was the Morgan Bank. And Morgan Bank founder was J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan had gone to only one university in all of his life 
and that was Göttingen in Germany. And Göttingen was a center for Hegelian thought and for uh, what Anthony Sutton calls Hegelian activism. And we know that this Hegelianism actually rubbed off on J.P. Morgan because it be, Hegelianism was his whole approach to uh, American, uh, the, the American political landscape. When he was here and when he was still alive, he used all sides against one another. And if you read Tragedy and Hope, you'll see that this rich capitalist was actually involved in building up the, the American anti-capitalist uh, uh, left. And um, that's probably what we have here going on, is the Hegelian tradition of the Mar Morgan firm continuing even after the merger with Chase. And, and mm -hmm. what, what we have is we have them building up the dialectical camp of Islamo-fascist terrorism. And what you have is you have America acting as the thesis, clashing with Islamo-fascism as, as the antithesis. And the synthesis is the rise of American empire. And uh, another individual that we have to look at when we look at, uh, at uh, uh, PTEC is we have to look at, uh, the, uh, at uh, Chertoff, Michael Chertoff, because uh, when, when GreenQuest went after PTEC, uh, the Justice Department and the FBI basically flipped this lid. The, the FBI tried to step in and tried to take control of the investigation. But then uh, when the uh, GreenQuest task force was going to be subsumed by, the, uh, by Homeland Security, uh, Michael Chertoff, who was at the time uh, the DOJ criminal division chief, uh, it pushed with the FBI for the FBI and for its parent, uh, the Justice Department, to actually take over GreenQuest. And, of course, this would have been a bad idea because they would be able then to sabotage all of GreenQuest's efforts. And all, it just goes back to the old saying of keep your friends close and keep your enemies mm -hmm. even closer. But uh, Michael Chertoff, of course, is related to this individual named Ben Chertoff, who had written a piece for uh, Popular Mechanics, which basically that piece for Popular Mechanics knocked down a bunch of 9-11 strongmen, in an, um, a strawmen, not strongmen, strawmen, in an attempt to uh, make all individuals asking questions about 9-11 look like baseless conspiracy theorists. And all. So, you know, that's uh, the, what I ultimately say at the end of the whole uh, PTEC affair is that is Grover Norquist really afraid about civil rights because civil rights don't really have anything to do with PTEC. Instead, it's got a lot to do with, uh, if, with terrorists receiving protection from the FBI and doing business with a major Wall Street firm. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, the keystone of the network that GreenQuest was investigating was uh, a group called the SAR Foundation. And I, I want to speak, I mean, we're not going to have time on the air today to do this, but I want to speak about them again at a later date, and I'm going to uh, write an article that expands upon the SAR Foundation. Well, the SAR Foundation is connected to a guy named Khalid bin Mahfouz. And people should re recognize Mahfouz because he was the director of the BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. And we know uh, BCCI because of all the different shady characters that were involved from Abu N uh, Nadal, the Palestinian uh, terrorist, to uh, Manuel Noriega from Panama. And Clinton, too, wasn't it? Hmm? Wasn't Clinton involved in that deal? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people, you surprised what names drop out mm -hmm. on, on that one. Uh, but what was very interesting to find was that the Central Intelligence Agency was actually trying to cover up the BCCI scandal. In 86, they put out a report over BCCI that simply referred to the uh, bank's methods as unorthodox and unconventional. And then they came out with a later report, which was just a 30-page document that said that the bank was a source of undetermined reliability and left it at that. And the reason that the CIA was stonewalling and being so secretive about BCCI would come out later with Richard Kerr, who was acting as BCI uh, prior to Robert Gates getting in in 91. And uh, what, what, Kerr, uh, uh, been, what Kerr basically admitted was that the CIA held accounts at BCCI. And he said that the accounts were ordinary and were lawful and honest. But then that begs the question, why did you uh, uh, cover up for so long? And the problem 
probably the reason why was because $2 billion in U.S. aid w went through that bank to the Mujahideen rebels, who, of course, were receiving support from the uh, uh, CIA and uh, were made up of people that had been lar uh, largely of people who had been radicalized by textbooks made by the Agency of International Development. And uh, another... Now, now people might ask, who's, who's the puppet master behind BCCI? Well, it wasn't Reagan, even though a lot of this was happen, happening under Reagan's time in office. Reagan, remember, he was 70 years old when he came into office. And all. he was probably the oldest man ever to be inaugurated as president then and now. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of us know that he was very much uh, showing signs of senility even then. And all. Uh, but if you look at George H.W. Bush, he actually looks like the primary manipulator behind BCCI, and he ties into BCCI through a little rock billionaire by the names of Jackson Stevens. And uh, Jackson Stevens, who was a uh, contributor to Bush through uh, Team 100, which was a Republican group, where you, which the membership in required that you make a $100,000 donation to Bush's election campaign. And uh, Marianne uh, Stevens, uh, Jackson Stevens' wife, uh, was back in 88 uh, the chairman of the Bush for President Drive. Also, don't you have a connection, too, between Daddy Bush and the Bin Ladens? Oh, yeah. Well, through yeah. Carlisle, and also Carlisle, right? Once again, Carlisle... Uh, to uh, Arbusto Energy, uh, well, Harkin Energy actually ties in uh, in a way. But the, the, when when uh, when Daddy Bush was uh, was dethroned, people thought, well, great, you know, maybe we'll get some truth with Bill Clinton. And the truth of the matter is, is that when Bill Clinton was running for governor, he found himself mm -hmm. in like a very uh, uh, bad. Uh, he was just in a bad way in back in 1990 when he was running in financial. He was not going to make it. He wasn't staying above, uh, above, above, you know, water. And so Stevens came forward and was able to get $100,000 raised up for him and a $2 million line of credit with Worthing National, the National Bank. So you have Jackson Stevens uh, not only behind Bush but behind Clinton. So that stuff wasn't going to, you know, the stuff over BCCI was not going mm -hmm. to come back in any way on on uh, on Daddy Bush uh, because Bill Clinton owed himself to Stevens as much as as as, uh, as George Bush and so you weren't going to have you know uh, some kind of uh, uh, turning on on old man Bush. Well, you know, just one other thing too, real quick. I often wondered sometimes if that was just the laundering of the money that uh, Clinton probably was making furtively as uh, the emperor of Arkansas with the Amina drug connection. It's possible. I mean, it's, yeah, it is. I mean, I just found that out. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's possible. But the, but the important thing to see is that some of the p same power elites that were behind George, uh, mm -hmm. George H.W., were actually behind Bill Clinton. When yep. Bill Clinton decided to run for president, who was standing behind him but Pamela Harriman, who was, of course, the... the widow of, of, I believe it was April. April. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this is this is the guy that had set up with Prescott Bush, uh, you know, the Union Banking Corporation. And, and so, you know, uh, the idea that these guys were going to actually, you know, uh, let anything serious come out about one another was just, just laughable. Yep. And all that. I believe that they that they didn't really like one another and that if Bush could have uh, dethroned Clinton and vice versa, they would have, but they weren't going to say anything that would let stuff fall out about the power elites that were behind them. Well, don't you feel, I mean, since, since uh, Reagan was assassinated, <clears throat> what, a month or so into his presidency, the fact that Ronnie was electable and George wasn't, the fact that Ronnie had to take... Um, Daddy Bush as a running mate, though he didn't like him. I mean, we could really look at a continuum from from um, Reagan's two terms, where Daddy Bush was president, Bush's presidency, two of Clinton, and now two of son Bush. I mean, you really have the same two-headed hydra, don't you? Almost. It's almost exactly like that. Now, Clinton was almost Clinton was almost knocked out of uh, out of power by individuals that were tied to Bush. You know, but he, I mean, uh, he had he had basically set up an insur insurance for himself, and you know, all you know that that well, you know, guys, just because you're done using me doesn't mean I'm not that doesn't mean that I'm going away, 
and all. For instance, we know that Carl Baca had shown up uh, to uh, at Gary Webb's uh, uh, doorstep with uh, these highly sensitive uh, grand jury transcripts, which are nearly impossible to get, that became the basis of his book, Dark Alliance, and that she was uh, set to marry Carlos Latier, who had been released from a prison by the by the uh, Clinton administration and who had landed in prison because of George H. W. Bush, and and you know so so you, you we get this idea that that this was some kind of Clinton operation to let them know look if the impeachment goes forward you know I'm going to drag you guys all down with me and all and it's also interesting that one hour after Henry Hyde had announced impeachment plans that. Uh, the Inspector T uh, General's Volume 2 of the report over the uh, CIA involvement in, uh, in drug smuggling uh, was released on the Internet, and Bill Clinton's, uh, 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 the, the DCI at the time, was a Clinton appointee, even though the, re the Congress was, was primarily Republican. Also, if I could, just one interesting element also with Letterer. He disappeared from the federal bu uh, prison system. At the time, the Chandra Levy was an intern working for the Federal um, Prison Bureau. That's right. Mm, that gets weird. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't mean to cut you off, but I mean, like, folks can also uh, read about that, um, read that article on the, on the net. What I wanted you to do, if, if, without trying to frustrate you, when you wrote this article, though, I mean, when you stand back from it, uh, why did you write it, and what does it say about what's going on? Well, what it says about what's going on is that <clears throat> America, uh, the reason that we find ourselves in this mess is because we no longer have, in my estimation, an effective internal security apparatus that would basically uh, look into the backgrounds of different government employees and see if there's any co uh, conflict of interest there that would warrant taking them out of government. And that would basically that would basically break the connection not only between government employees and these terrorists, but also between the government employees and the uh, and the power elite. Um, now, the way that we got our internal security apparatus stripped probably goes back to the McCarthy era. Now, McCarthy's n another one of those characters that some people believe was a demagogue and other people believe was a martyr. And I, again, believe that it was somewhere in between. The truth is somewhere in between with that. If he had continued working with, the, with Kennedy, he probably would have been a hero. His problem is this one man, Roy Cohn, which is a guy that you could trust probably as far as you could throw. This man was tied into the power elite, tied to the process church. He was being used to manage McCarthy, and McCarthy was actually profitable for a time for the power elite because he got everybody but his attention diverted onto domestic communism and away from the activities of the power elite. And what happened was that when, when McCarthy went after, wanted to go after William Bundy because William Bundy had made a contribution of about $100 to Alger Hiss's defense fund, people got excited because a lot of stuff could have come out that would, that really wasn't about communism at all, but was about Skull and Bones, which is a, mm -hmm. an elite conduit. And so at that point, the power elite came to appreciate the fact that inter an internal security apparatus could be used against them, and they began to build up the left here in this country, and the left used, uh, used the term McCarthyism to demonize any attempts at internal security and the different layers of internal security that we had were stripped away. And what we need is we need an internal security uh, 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 apparatus once more because working for the government is a privilege. It's not a right. Oh, and, all. and the reason that we don't have one is because of what it would reveal about certain people in government right now. And I point towards Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz, who is having uh, an affair with this woman, Shaha Riza, uh, who was born in Tunisia and who b grew up in Saudi Arabia. Now, she claims that she's a feminist, so that's not exactly a quality of, that we would find with an Islamo-fascist. But what you've got to understand is that in the world of intelligence, there's what is known as legends, which are, are manufactured background stories that a, a person has to make them look like something that they are not, so right. that they have a cover. So this could always be a cover that this mm -hmm. lady has. And so the question is, is Paul Wolfowitz compromised? Is he working for the other side? Now, you know, uh, we, we won't know. We have no way of knowing well, unless there was some 
kind of inquiry by some kind of internal security. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, though, Paul and Phil. And if we can, we'll pick it up perhaps next time we can get together, uh, say, in November. Sure. All right, listen, thanks very much for spending time with us. Again, uh, Paul, feel better also, and uh, we'll catch you guys in a couple of weeks. Sure. All right, thank you very much. God bless you both. Bye. Bye-bye.